So this is the lecture for Module 5, where we read Part 4 of Whitehead's Process and Reality on the Theory of Extension. This is one of the most difficult uh, philosophical uh, explications that you will find. Whitehead, in this part, is um, carrying forward work that he began many decades earlier in his exploration of the uh, what he calls a theory of extension. And he's looking uh, all the way back into the late 1890s for an account of extension that is more general than our intuitions of space. It's a form of extension that spatial intuition presupposes. And as we go along here, hopefully what I'm saying there will make more sense to you. What Whitehead, in effect, accomplishes in part four is the uh, formalization of a non-metrical theory of extension. And why is that important? Well, uh, Euclid's geometry, which was the basis of geometrical reasoning um, for, you know, thousands of years, uh, is asking us to un to understand the nature of a straight line uh, as though we had to measure first in order to determine what the shortest distance between two points was. Whitehead is trying to find a way using what's called uh, projective geometry uh, to define a straight line that doesn't in, in such a way that it doesn't require a measurement. He wants to formally define it and he thinks that this uh, solves a problem for, for modern science, which in order to measure anything needs to assume the definition of a straight line, but can't um, really get that through definition alone because it needs to measure first. But in order to measure, you already need straight lines. You need a straight, uh, rigid ruler, right? So we'll, we'll return to this issue, but... Whitehead here is accomplishing a non-metrical theory of extension. He's defining all of these uh, geometrical elements like points and lines and planes without making reference to any um, metrical space. And so to say that it's a projective geometry or a method of uh, projective geometry is a bit of a misnomer because geometry already implies that there's measurement, right? Geometry, whereas the sort of Another way of talking about it is as a topological method. Whitehead's not making any reference to measurement. He's not making any reference to space. He's trying to uh, derive our understanding of space as a dimensional um, you know, uh, area of some kind or volume from purely formal definitions, right? So that measurement doesn't become the empirical question of measurement is made possible by his definitions. So you'll remember in uh, part three of Process and Reality, Whitehead goes into his theory of prehensions and he says that this is a genetic analysis uh, of process or of reality and that there's another form of analysis that he calls coordinate analysis that he will discuss in part four. So here we are ready to discuss coordinate division or coordinate analysis. He also calls it morphological. Um, and what is different about coordinate analysis is that um, in genetic analysis, we were looking at what happens inside of the process of concrescence as um, a multitude of prehensions grow together towards their subjective aim uh, and towards their satisfaction. Coordinate analysis is looking at the satisfaction. It's looking at the way that either actual occasions relate to one another in an, what Whitehead calls an extensive continuum, or the way that those prehensions relate to one another uh, within an individual concrescence. So um, Whitehead wants to point out that this is a purely hypothetical method of analysis because the fact is each concrescence is it's a holistic process. And so when, whenever we freeze it and analyze it and consider this part as separate from that part, it's a purely hypothetical kind of intellectual exercise and abstraction. It's valuable. It helps us 
gain some insight into what's going on. But what's concretely going on is an undivided process, right? So Whitehead will say that the extensive continuum is um, it, it's divisible, but in itself it is undivided, right? So it can be hypothetically divided. And so we need to keep in mind that the universe doesn't come um, chopped up into these bits, uh, into these slices of time and space, but rather is itself a holistic process of becoming, and that each process of concrescence must be considered as a whole if we want to understand it in its concreteness. But nonetheless, uh, as an aid to our understanding of the nature of reality, we can use these forms of analysis uh, to dig into the inner workings of these undivided, but and concretely undivided, but abstractly divisible processes. So Whitehead starts off uh, by telling us that um, whereas genetic division analyzes concrescence right, into its various phases, we looked at that in part three, um, he says that these phases within concrescence are not themselves in what we call physical time, because physical time he says, is it's the reverse. Physical time is in the phases of growth, right? It's physical time is in the concrescence. And physical time itself only makes its appearance when we look at the coordinate division of the satisfaction of these um, actual occasions, right? So he'll say that the actual occasion is the enjoyment of a certain, he says, quantum of physical time. But the genetic process is not uh, a kind of temporal succession, right? It's the exact opposite for Whitehead. Uh, rather, each phase of the concrescent process presupposes the whole quantum um, of physical time. And so, in a sense, physical time is achieved by, or produced by, or is, is, is a construction of um, actual occasions of experience as they um, reach satisfaction and then um, are transferred or transmitted to the next moment of experience. It's a series of these transmissions um, that when we stand back and look via coordinate analysis, um, we gain a sense of physical time, right? Because each concrescence is taking place in what we can only refer to as a paradoxically as a kind of temporal eternity, right? Because each concrescence, it's prehending already completed past actual occasions of experience, and it's ingressing uh, eternal possibilities. And so there's an intersection of eternality and temporality in each concrescence. And the accumulation or the accumulation of these uh, concrescent intersections of eternity or possibility and time or, you know, the past, the intersection of these and the synthesis of them in each concrescence is what uh, produces physical time. So Whitehead will tell us that this um, quantum of physical time in each concrescence is, it's also, it also has a spatial element or an extensive region. Um, and he says that uh, when we do coordinate division of these regions, what that sort of division yields what that sort of analysis results in uh, is a set of extensive quanta, and he calls these extensive quanta standpoints. Um, and these are uh, divisions that are not, in fact, real, but they might be, right? They're hypothetical, because the reality is the unbroken whole, right? But through a process of abstraction, we can consider what might be the case if we were to separate off this part, let's say separate off these prehensions from those prehensions within a given concrescence, or separate off these actual occasions from the rest of the actual occasions in this nexus, just to think of what they might be independent, right? But really, in concrete reality, everything's connected to everything else. So, so Whitehead tells us that only the physical pole of an actual occasion can be revealed uh, by way of coordinate analysis or coordinate division, because the mental pole, he says, is incurably one, right? So 
we can't divide the mental pole without totally scrambling its significance. Whereas the physical pole uh, can be at least hypothetically divided. Whitehead says that when the addition of an occasion's mental pole is trivial, however, in other words, in low-grade actual occasions without much, um, without much ingression of novelty, then the coordinate division won't be missing much, right? But he says it's an empirical issue to decide when the mental pole is significant and when it's not. But again, usually for low-grade physical occasions, it's not that significant. So insofar as it is not relevant, Whitehead says, we are dealing with an indefinitely subdivisible extensive universe, right? So if we take the mental pole out, nature can be indefinitely divided, at least, again, hypothetically. So Whitehead tells us that a coordinate division is a contrast between the parent actual entity and the proposition, which is the potentiality of that superject, the parent's uh, occasions superject, having arisen from the physical standpoint of the restricted subregion, right? So the division, the coordinate division, thus asks, what if everything but this subregion was eliminated from the objectified world of the parent occasion? What do things look like in that case? So strictly speaking, the proposition um, is false because it leaves out the mental pole, right? But if properly qualified, it may still contain important or interesting truths. So, you know, Whitehead says that the actual world is atomic in the sense that it comes in these uh, completed holes, these concrescences. But in another sense, the actual world is indefinitely divisible. And he's just pointing out here that um, when we do coordinate analysis, we cannot break apart the mental pole. We can, however, divide the physical pole, even though the extensive continuum is itself undivided, we can abstractly, uh, hypothetically divide it for the purposes of analysis. Whitehead says, the world expands through recurrent unifications of itself. Each, by the addition of itself, automatically recreating the multiplicity anew. So here, it's another restatement of the line he gives us, you know, way back in part one of process and reality, the many become one and are increased by one. This is the secret formula uh, that reveals really the, the key to Whitehead's entire ontology. So what does Whitehead mean by this extensive continuum? Uh, we've talked about this in prior modules, but in this part of process and reality, he reminds us that the extensive continuum is the pervading generic form to which the morphological structures of the organisms of the world conform. Uh, the extensive continuum is a field of potentiality that informs and shapes the experience of each actual occasion within its own concrescence but also the experience of each actual occasion of other actual occasions. So this extensive continuum, it's the most uh, gen generic or general form or abstract scheme that Whitehead thinks uh, metaphysics can access. And he's later in this part going to define the character of this scheme in terms of uh, these non-metrical principles uh, or definitions from which uh, geometry, whether Euclid's form or the various non-Euclidean forms of curved geometry, uh, from which those can all be derived. So Whitehead's trying to find the generic structure of extension, right, that's prior to all the special forms of geometry that mathematicians know about. So this extensive continuum as uh, an ingredient in the experience of every actual occasion, Whitehead tells us it doesn't, the extensive continuum and its, its character, its abstract character, does not determine what is transmitted, but it does determine the conditions to which all transmission must conform. Whitehead, in this context, talks about the actual world in its function as a medium. 
What does that mean? Uh, Whitehead says that, you know, an actual occasion that has concressed isn't just prehending all the other actual occasions in its environment. It's also prehending uh, through its objectifications of those other actual occasions. It's prehending the way that those occasions perceived their world, right? Because again, don't forget that an actual world is defined by the concrescent occasion in question. So every actual occasion defines its own actual world. Its actual world is the perspective brought forth uh, through the achievement uh, of its concrescence. So in one way, you, we have to say that there are many actual worlds. But because, as Whitehead puts it, um, every concrescence treats the world as a kind of medium that facilitates chains of indirect object objectification, a solidarity is, is retained. The solidarity of the world is retained despite this multiplicity of perspectives. Because again, each concrescence in prehending other occasions of experience in its environment is also prehending those occasions' perspectives. So the actual worlds of all the occasions of experience prehended in the concrescence of another actual occasion uh, are being objectified, are being transmitted along with, in an indirect way, along with just those occasions themselves. So just to step back for a minute here, you know, Whitehead's describing reality as uh, what is brought forth in the experience of actual occasions. And so in a fully experiential ontology like Whitehead's, how is it that we define what is normally called the external world, right? How do we talk about something outside of the experience of any particular occasion? That's what this theory of extension is all about. That's what the extensive continuum allows us to talk about. Uh, how do we get what in the philosophical tradition are called external relations in a system of the universe like Whitehead's where internal relations are so dramatically foregrounded. Uh, in the tradition of philosophy, internal relations have been downplayed. Whitehead's really bringing them back into uh, the story here in a major way, but he's not getting rid of so-called external relations. External relations are what allow us to distinguish between one actual occasion and another actual occasion, or between one prehension and another prehension. But again, you know, we can make these distinctions in a hypothetical way, though, of course, the universe as a whole hangs together, right? There is a solidarity of the world. It is a holistic process. And so any form of analysis or division is always going to be hypothetical. But nonetheless, we do make these divisions. That's what allows us to make distinctions between me and you, for example. But Whitehead understands these divisions in terms of what he calls perceptive bonds of transmission. So there's an extensive connection uh, through the process of prehension. It's a perceptive bond of transmission. It's not like there are isolated entities in Whitehead's universe. So he talks about Descartes and contrasts his own theory of extension with Descartes' theory. So Whitehead says that uh, for Descartes, the primary attribute of physical bodies is extension, whereas... For the philosophy of organism, the primary relationship of physical occasions is extensive connection, right? So rather than in the substance property or substance attribute ontology of Descartes, where the primary attribute of physical bodies is extension, for Whitehead's process relational ontology, we get rid of attributes and instead we get relationships. Um, and instead of just extension as... Uh, you know, mutual externality, we get this sense of extens extensive connection. And again, those extensive connections between entities are perceptive bonds of transmission. And these perceptive bonds of transmission, think again about the world and its function as a medium, right? Where an occasion is not only prehending other occasions in its environment, but it's prehending the perspectives achieved by those occasions, right? Those are perceptive bonds that allow for a sense of extensive connection to be maintained so that 
there is this sense of um, an extended world, an external world. Everything's in the experience of occasions of experience, <laughs> but at the same time, these occasions of experience are sharing a common world. That's the picture that Whitehead's trying to paint for us. So Whitehead's generic account of the character of extension is what allows our world to be a community. It's Whitehead's account of how the solidarity of the world is possible. And it defines what is physically actual, too. Um, Whitehead says that physical space and time, as physical scientists study them, they are um, they presuppose the more generic relationship of extension. So there is, in Whitehead's terms, a temporalization of extension, and there is a spatialization of extension. So the dimensionality of space... You know, we say we live in three dimensions of space and one dimension of time or a four-dimensional spatio-temporal continuum. Whitehead says that, that these are special characteristics of our particular cosmic epoch. They're not found in the generic description of extension itself, right? The three dimensions of space known to Euclid and the seriality of time, these are not part of the generic character of extension itself. These characteristics of space and time, they evolve in our cosmic epoch. In that sense, they are special achievements of our particular cosmos. And you could think of this in cosmological terms as, you know, our Big Bang and the universe brought forth in this 13.8 um, billion year process that that's the space and time that we think are that physicists usually think of as ultimate, um, and the laws of physics that apply within that spatio-temporal arena, these are all evolutionary achievements. These are habits, not so much laws, right? The very dimensionality of space and time for Whitehead are achievements of our cosmic epoch. Very important to recognize. Whitehead says, nature is never complete. It is always passing beyond itself. It's on page 289. So Whitehead says that the theory of prehensions embodies a protest against the bifurcation of nature because Whitehead's theory of prehensions allows us to understand the transaction between private individuals and the public world, right? This is another way of getting at what I was just saying earlier about the way that reality is in the experience of actual occasions. And yet, given that premise, there's still a way to account for what we call the external world, to account for what we call uh, the extended world. So for Whitehead, uh, the public side of actuality is uh, understood as the superjective aspect of concrescence. The superject is, it's a moment of passage from decided public facts to a novel public fact. So in other words, in the process of concrescence, there's a passage from decided public facts in the sense that the concrescence in its process of achieving satisfaction is inheriting the public facts of the past. It's inheriting the already completed occasions of experience. It's then, uh, through a process of integration, achieving a new subjective perspective on those public facts, but then that subjective perspective, which is private, it perishes, and it becomes a novel public fact. So, Public facts, in this sense, are where we do coordinate division. Private facts, or the private side of actuality, again, is the subjective side rather than the superjective side. So on the private side of actuality, we're talking about the formation of a subject. We're talking about, in Whitehead's terms, the genesis of self-enjoyment. We're talking about uh, purposeful self-creation out of the materials that are publicly at hand, right? Those materials are the given facts of the past. Each new, newly concressing occasion inherits those given facts of the past that are, that are publicly at hand, and it transforms them into a new moment uh, of self-enjoyment. Whitehead says that eternal objects, as ingredients in every concrescence, they can be considered in two ways. They can be considered in reference to the publicity of things, or in reference to the privacy of things. And Whitehead says that 
when eternal objects are considered in reference to the public world, uh, they're akin to universals. When we use eternal objects to think about private self-enjoyment, they're akin to qualities or uh, characteristics. So et eternal objects, in that sense, um, they have an objective side and they have a subjective side, right? Um, objective eternal objects, Whitehead says, they function relationally to allow occasions of experience to objectify one another. And this, in a sense, is what the solidarity of the world depends upon, this capacity for mutual objectification. Objectification is, in a sense, abstraction. Um, each actual occasion uh, objectifies the other occasions in its environment um, by ingressing a set of eternal objects to characterize them. And for Whitehead, these objective uh, eternal objects are close to Plato's understanding of mathematical forms. These forms of uh, eternal objects, they, they concern the world as a medium of transmission. They are what allow the world to hang together in terms of its extensive uh, connections, the extensive connections between e each actual occasion. These exten extensive connections are um, they're topological. And in our cosmic epoch, after space and time have been brought forth, they're also geometrical, right? They're geometrical relationships that we are all subject to because it is through these, you know, Whitehead calls them, as we'll see in a moment, um, strains, geometrical strains that we literally feel in our bodies. These geometrical strains coordinate our bodies and all of the actual occasions making up our bodies with other actual occasions where bound together, right? These perceptive bonds or these geometrical strains uh, allow us to achieve some objective sense of coordination in um, an extended space and time. So that's the objective uh, form of eternal objects. And uh, there's also a subjective form of eternal objects that have to do with the subjective form of each actual occasion of experience. And um, it's important to remember that Whitehead's theory of prehension is premised on the doctrine that there are no concrete facts anywhere in nature that are merely public or merely private. Uh, every prehension has a public and a private side, right? So in other words, every prehension has an external and an internal side. A prehension is precisely what mediates between uh, externality and internality. So the subjective species of eternal objects, uh, rather than being mathematical and these geometrical strange, uh, strains and so on, subjective eternal objects, they function in the subjective forms of each actual occasion. They're emotional responses of pleasure or pain and so on. Um, and they, they can also function relationally because you know the world as a medium is functioning such that um, occasion B objectifies occasion A with the subjective form that occasion A uh, had. So it's not just that B is objectifying A as a superject. Part of the superjective nature of A is the subjective form that A uh, felt its world in terms of, right? So there's a certain way that every occasion reacts to its objective datum, right? So the objective datum is, say, the objective species of eternal objects, giving each occasion the geometrical layout of its actual world. The subjective form responds to that layout and says, oh, that's good, that's good, or, oh, I don't like that, or, oh, you know, that's nice. That's, it's an emotional response, right? And then that occasion perishes with that subjective form along with its objective datum, and the next occasion of experience inherits all of that. So it also gets the, the subjective form or, or the emotional response along with the objective datum or the, the perspective that that occasion had on the world. On the other hand, Whitehead reminds us that when we're doing coordinate analysis, when we're coordinately dividing the extensive continuum uh, the, the subjective eternal objects, the subjective forms are lost because these are already, um, you know, part of the mental pole. In coordinate analysis, we're only retaining the objective eternal objects. In other words, 
um, the mathematical or, or geometrical forms uh, that are part of the physical pole of a concrescence. So in summary, uh, genetic analysis, right, that we looked at in part three of process and reality on the theory of prehensions, genetic analysis deals with concrescent immediacy, while coordinate, na coordinate analysis that we're looking at now in part four on the theory of extension, it deals with the concrete object. It deals with the superject, the result of the process of concrescence, or you might say the product of the process of concrescence. So whereas in a, in a genetic analysis, we're trying to understand final causality, the way that all of the prehensions grow together toward the subjective aim, uh, which is then achieved when the subject uh, unifies, achieves satisfaction, and then perishes. This is a process, of, it's a teleological process. It's a process with aims, right? So this is an account that deals with um, final causality. Coordinate analysis, on the other hand, is an account in terms of efficient causality. It's how uh, the product of the process of concrescence results in a certain set of um, objective conditions that then guide subsequent occasions of experience. And this is Whitehead's understanding of efficient causality, the way that the objectified past uh, transmits itself into the present and into the future. So as Whitehead has already explained to us, the mental pole of an actual occasion is incurably atomic, he says, which is to say that it's uh, one solid decision, and if we try to divide it up, we end up falsifying uh, that decision, that um, novel contribution to the creative advance of nature. On the other hand, the physical pole uh, can be divided, at least hypothetically speaking, and when we do coordinate analysis, we are hypothetically dividing up the physical pole. So coordinate division or coordinate analysis is analysis of physical connections. Uh, it's an analysis of our physical experience. So in this uh, part, part four of process and reality, Whitehead's going to try to do over what Euclid attempted in his book Elements, which, you know, shaped our understanding of geometry for thousands of years. Up until, you know, the early 1800s, uh, when other parallel postulates um, were uh, asserted and new forms of geometry, non-Euclidean geometry, uh, were articulated. And this, of course, was essential to uh, it laid the groundwork for what Einstein did in the 20th century with his relativity theory, this notion of curved space, building on some of the mathematical theories of Riemann and uh, Lobachevsky and um, Minkowski and others, Lorentz. Um, these are other forms of geometry that uh, don't have the same sorts of definitions and assumptions that Euclid did. Now, what Whitehead is doing is even before any of these geometries, whether Euclidean or non-Euclidean, he's looking for an account of extension that is non-metrical, that he, Whitehead thinks, through this account, that he has proved that the definition of a straight line and all the other elements uh, can be provided without making any reference to measurement. This is different from Euclid, for whom the straightest distance between two points uh, sorry, but the shortest distance between two points is how straightness is defined, and that's bringing in measurement into what should be a purely formal proof. So for Whitehead, you know, he wants, he's going to show us some diagrams in this part to illustrate what he's talking about, his, his definitions and assumptions, but he says that diagrams are apt to be misleading. Why? Because they introduce features which are special to the two-dimensional spatial extensiveness of a sheet of paper. Kind of obvious point, but it's very important to keep in mind. So um, I'm not going to go through all these definitions and assumptions. If you have mathematical training, go through them. Um, we can certainly discuss them. Uh, but I want to just 
keep a, a sort of big picture view on this to understand that, um, you know, again, Whitehead is articulating a mariotopological derivation of geometrical elements like points, lines, and planes. So he will and at one point rehearse Euclid's definitions and postulates, and he'll point out the ways that, you know, Greek geometry, ancient Greek geometry kind of muddled the difference between abstract forms and concrete physical things. Um, because, you know, for Whitehead, geometry has to do with the investigation of the physical world, yes, but we should never identify any geometrical scheme, any particular geometrical scheme, with the physical world itself. Um, like uh, another really influential uh, French mathematician, uh, Henri Poincaré, Whitehead is a conventionalist when it comes to which geometrical scheme uh, we apply to nature. This is different from, say, Einstein, who seems to have believed that his four-dimensional ge geometrical manifold um, wasn't just a description of of space-time, but that space-time, the space-time continuum, really did have this particular geometrical form. There's an identification between the geometrical scheme and uh, physical nature. Whitehead says different geometrical schemes can be useful for different purposes, depending on what it is we're trying to measure, and that it's the, it's committing the fallacy of misplaced concreteness to identify physical nature with a particular geometrical scheme. It could be that for some purposes, you know, an 11 dimensional geometry is best uh, for understanding what's going on in nature. And for other purposes, the normal Euclidean three dimensional geometry works just fine. You know, like if we're trying to build a shed in the backyard, <laughs> we don't need, uh, you know, Riemannian manifolds. Like the, just give us a ruler and, and an understanding of congruence and so on that Euclid already provides and we can build our shed, right? So Whitehead's a conventionalist about geometry. Now, what he wants to point out in sort of rehearsing some of Euclid's definitions and postulates is that um, Euclid did not properly define a line uh, or a straight line. Euclid makes refer reference to this notion of evenness, that a straight line is um, an even line between two points, but what does even really mean? This isn't formally defined. Um, it doesn't remove ambiguity. And so, as a result, Whitehead says, up until modern times, straightness has been based upon measurement, right? We say the shortest distance between two points defines a straight line, but measurement is built into this definition so that it's not really a definition, um, a formal definition because it requires this empirical measurement. And Whitehead says modern physics has practically uh, defined straight lines by uh, referring to light rays, or in Whitehead's terms, to a root of certain physical occurrences. Um, and Whitehead admits that the existence of straight lines at all it depends on the dimensional character of our extensive continuum, right? And as I mentioned earlier, the dimensionality of space-time in our cosmic epoch is evolutionarily emergent. It's it's not, um, you know, something that's programmed into the nature of the generic character of the extensive continuum. It's certainly possible, of course it has to be possible for these um, dimensions of space and time that we inhabit to evolve out of the extensive continuum, but the extensive continuum itself um, Whitehead says we can barely even characterize it at all because it's so metaphysically general. He thinks that it's general description, meaning the description of um, this field of possibility that precedes our cosmic epoch or any cosmic epoch, that it has something to do with the relationship among wholes and parts, the logical relationships that hold when we um, think in terms of wholes and their relationship to parts. So Whitehead um, will say that, you know, out of the extensive continuum with these very basic characteristics, uh, any number of dimensions could be defined. Um, in 
chapter three on flat loci, Whitehead's going to use what he calls um, the ovate classes of planes or ovals uh, to define a four-dimensional um, space-time, which is the one that we seem to inhabit in our physical universe. And what Whitehead is able to do is um, he proves that the characteristic properties of straight lines, of planes, and of uh, flat spaces or volumes, that these characteristics can be discoverable in the extensive continuum without any recourse to measurement, right? So he defines evenness instead of just assuming it um, in the way that Euclid and, and most uh, modern science has. So Whitehead then transitions to uh, asking how continuous transmission is possible in a physical world, given this famous paradox from the Greek philosopher Zeno, uh, which, you know, the, the illustration that's given is that uh, when an arrow is fired at a target, we can consider its motion mathematically or, or geometrically by saying that, well, at some point that arrow will be, will, will, uh, travel half the distance to the target, and then it will travel half of that remaining distance, and then half that remaining distance, and then half that remaining distance, and so on and so on. And if you keep having the distance between the arrow and its target, you'll reach this uh, point where you realize there's a sort of infinite regress of uh, divisions of space. And so the question becomes, with this sort of geometrical analysis of the motion of the arrow, uh, in a purely intellectual sense, there's no way the arrow could ever reach the target because there's always going to be another distance that can be halved. Um, now, this may seem like uh, a bit of, you know, sort of scholastic nonsense, right? Because obviously we know the arrow hits the target. We know that motion is possible and that distances are traversed. So somehow... While this might be an intellectual paradox, nature accomplishes it all the time. So Whitehead approaches it in this way. How do we resolve this intellectual difficulty that we, we run into um, when we're trying to analyze motion? And Whitehead's answer is his atomic or epical theory uh, of becoming, right? So this is hearkening back to what Whitehead says earlier in Process in Reality, that there is no continuity of becoming there is a becoming of continuity. So when he talks about, um, when we talk about the continuity of nature or the space-time continuum for Whitehead, this continuity is derivative. It's derivative from the pulsations of actual occasions, right? Inheriting one another and projecting themselves into the future. So Whitehead's an atomist, but his atoms are durations, right? And they're dynamic. They're not just BBs. They're not just substantial particles uh, that are inert. Whitehead's atoms are uh, creatures. They're living occasions of experience. So he overcomes Zeno's paradox um, by talking about the, the way that the transmission um, from one occasion to the next takes place through a successive, through successive quanta of uh, extensiveness rather than through some continuous motion, right? And so there's a pulsation and um, a succession of objectification of the past. And it's through this account uh, that we no longer have this paradox. So Whitehead's reforming the intellectual abstractions we use to think about motion, to think about uh, movement in nature, such that we don't, we don't have these paradoxes arising anymore. And a very interesting implication of uh, Whitehead's resolution to Zeno's paradox and of his whole um, epical theory of becoming, his atomic theory of becoming, is that uh, it allows Whitehead to make sense of those exceptional circumstances uh, when telepathy or something more ordinary like the instinctive apprehension of a tone of feeling in social intercourse Allows him, allows him to make sense of how this is possible uh, because we're able to, through the inheritance of each pulsa pulsation of actuality, um, 
the mental pole, right, as well as the physical pole of prior occasions is prehended and absorbed into the next moment of experience. Um, so there's, there's a way in which the ability for, say, me to telepathically read the thoughts of someone else in Whitehead's universe, that's actually possible. Um, it's possible only in exceptional circumstances because normally the, our physical feelings are dominating rather than our conceptual feelings. Um, but nonetheless, it's possible for something like telepathy to take place. Um, but way more often in our ordinary experience, we have this um, ability to kind of walk into a room and know what the mood is like. And for Whitehead, this isn't something that we abstractly construct um, by looking at cues. Um, it's rather something that we just immediately feel. Um, you know, for Whitehead, we don't need a theory of mind in order to know that um, other people have an internal perspective on the world and that they're um, having their own feelings, right? That they have their own perspective on things. Whitehead thinks that we immediately feel this. We're not constructing it theoretically, right? A lot of times psychologists and philosophers of mind will talk about this theory of mind, and that only humans have it, and maybe some other primates. They're talking about the, our ability to know that there are other consciousnesses aside from our own. And Whitehead's saying, that no, no, we physically feel this. This isn't a theoretical construction. Uh, this is a fact of our experience that we're inheriting through um, these historical roots of actual occasions. So as we've heard numerous times, Whitehead has a kind of diminished view. He wants to diminish the centrality of consciousness for philosophy and metaphysics. Uh, it's not that he doesn't think consciousness is a glorious achievement, but he says, you know, it's the crown uh, of evolution. It's not its base. Its base is the base of the evolutionary process of nature uh, is physical feeling. So Whitehead says in general, consciousness is negligible. Blind physical purposes reign, right? I mean, and most philosophers in the modern period don't talk about physical purposes or physical feelings. Uh, they talk about causality, which for them is blind, merely mechanistic. For Whitehead, causality is the transmission of feelings. And most of nature is the unconscious tra transmission of feelings, which is to say that, um, you know, another way Whitehead phrases this is, is that he says that blind prehensions are the ultimate bricks of the physical universe. When he says blind here, he's meaning not conscious. In other words, um, these prehensions are not considering abstract possibilities uh, to the extent that a conscious prehension or conscious occasion of experience would, right? Consciousness is the feeling of negation, remember. Um, it's the comparison between um, what is factually given, what is physically felt, and what remains possible, given what we physically feel. So, you know, Whitehead doesn't want to center consciousness in the way that Descartes does, in the way that Kant does. He's really upending the subject-centric, or I should say consciousness-centric uh, way that modern philosophers have approached the nature of reality. Whitehead's also upending a lot of modern science in the sense that he's shifting from... Uh, the notion of material or matter to the notion of organism as the basic idea of physical science. He's shifting from a notion of static stuff to a notion of fluent energy, uh, but fluent energy that has a quantum structure. Uh, in other words, it's not just a continuous flow, right? There's a waveform, and the waveform is such that uh, we can distinguish and have to distinguish discrete quanta of energy. Um, so, you know, Whitehead is reforming the metaphysical scheme that underlies physical science because of the discoveries that physical science itself is making, both relativistic physics and quantum physics. Because in these uh, domains of physical science, um, as far as Whitehead could tell in the mid-1920s, uh, the notion of vacuous material passively enduring in empty space, that those ideas are totally vanished from natural science. 
So Whitehead tells us that there are no inert facts in nature. He says all facts promote feeling and are felt. And he says that all origination is private. All origination of feeling is private, right? It happens within concrescence. But, he continues, what has been thus originated publicly pervades the world, right? Subjective privacy perishes and becomes superjective um, and, and in that sense, objectively immortal. Um, it becomes public. So Whitehead says that in our cosmic epoch, geometrical facts are felt by actual occasions to have a certain dominant importance. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these geometrical facts are called strains. And these strains have multiple functions. Um, one of them is uh, when we talk about perception in the mode of presentational immediacy, um, we can think of the uh, present external world with its um, spatial extension and its, its qualitative um, character, usually colors, right? If you just think of your visual field right now, um, it's spatially extended and there are patches of color characterizing the objects in that extended domain. Now, Whitehead refers to this as a process of projection, and it's a process of projection of um, qualitative uh, sensa onto geometrical strains. So all the enduring objects in our environment are connected through these geometrical strains, and in our experience of presentational immediacy, um, you know, if you look at a contemporaneous object in, in your environment, Whitehead is saying that you kind of intuit its location through a geometrical strain. And that through a geometrical strain, you know, the greenness of the leaves on the tree uh, in front of you is, uh, it's projected uh, along that strain. So, you know, this is a very abstract account of perception, but it's all part of Whitehead's attempt to make sense of how measurement is possible. Because for Whitehead, all uh, precise measurement takes place through the mode of presentation, the mode of perception of presentational immediacy. So science really depends upon this mode of perception to take precise measurements. But now Whitehead reminds us that presentational immediacy is a derivative mode of perception and that what's primary is the mode of perception and causal efficacy, right? So while for philosophers, simple private sensations in the mode of presentational immediacy may have logical priority, they do not have physical priority, uh, which is to say that, you know, if we're going to analyze the contemporary visual scene, we're going to start with sensations uh, of a, a patch of red here, a patch of green there. But if we want to understand um, the origin of these private, seemingly private sensations, we're going to need to think in terms of causal efficacy, uh, which is the way that we feel the contemporary world through our body, through feelings of bodily transmission or bodily efficacy, right? Um, we know that we experience the greenness of the leaf in our contemporary spatially projected environment because light is reflecting off the leaf, uh, being transmitted to our retinas and then being transmitted along the nerves uh, of our body to the presiding occasion floating in the interstices of the brain, Whitehead says, and that for all of this to work, there needs to be causal efficacy um, and the presentational immediacy of uh, projected sensa on spatially arrayed objects is a very late derivative phase in the process of perception. Very important for science to make precise measurement, but it is not therefore um, that mode of perception which we should give priority in metaphysical discussions. So as an example, uh, one of the precious few examples that Whitehead gives, he says, uh, the child first dimly elucidates the complex externality of particular things, exhibiting a welter of forms of definiteness, and then disentangles his impressions of these forms in isolation. So Whitehead's talking about the way that you know, as we develop our perceptual skill as human beings, we begin with causal efficacy of the uh, vague streaming in of influences from the environment. And gradually, 
we uh, hone our capacity to disentangle uh, discrete impressions from uh, out of the welter so that we can then perceive um, the green leaf uh, as part of the tree uh, rather than it just being a sort of um, sort of uh, blooming, buzzing confusion, to use William James's term. Another example that Whitehead gives, uh, he says that a young man does not initiate his experience by dancing with impressions of sensation and then proceed to conjecture a partner. His experience takes the converse route, right? This is on page 316. So in other words, Whitehead is, Whitehead is saying we don't build an internal model up in our heads uh, that's, that's derived from just bare patches of color projected into our spatial environment, right? That would be how we must do it if presentational immediacy was the primary mode of perception rather than the derivative mode. Um, causal efficacy is the primary mode, right? So we experience a real dance partner out there whose uh, conceptual and physical feelings are transmitted into our uh, our experience uh, as a real creature out there, right? And we feel the presence of that creature first, and it's only through uh, abstraction that we then come to say, oh, well, you know, this is just uh, an appearance of a person, and it's really just a sensory experience cobbled together through a process of association in my mind. You know, artists need to be highly trained to perceive let's say, the contours of a human face in terms of the interplay of light and shadow, right, and patches of color. It's a highly trained form of perception to not just see a face, right, but to see the array of light and shadow. Um, what we immediately perceive is the whole human face and the whole complex of emotion inherited from that face. So whether we're talking about the perception of uh, impressions of sensation, or we're talking about the perception of the emotional state of other people. Uh, Whitehead says that none of these operations can be segregated from nature into the subjective privacy of a mind. He says that mental and physical operations are incurably intertwined, and that both issue into publicity and are derived from publicity. And he thinks that, you know, if we negate this or neglect this intertwining of mental and physical operations, that he says we have no hope for a rational cosmology. Um, because in order to understand the interconnections among things in the universe, we're not just trying to understand how, you know, um, two particles collide. We're trying to understand how two human beings relate to one another. And for Whitehead, these things are on a continuum, um, very vastly different in complexity, but nonetheless, the same metaphysical principles have to allow us to explain the collision of particles and the conversation between human beings, right? That's, that's the challenge that Whitehead uh, puts on this endeavor to construct a rational cosmology. The same categories have to apply from top to bottom. So I want to say a bit about Whitehead's relationship to Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein famously said that the difference between the past, the present, and the future is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion, and that the physicist knows that time is, in a sense, uh, unreal. Um, it's merely psychological. It's a kind of psychological uh, projection or delusion of some kind to think that time has this direction uh, from the past, out of the past, and into the future. Uh, Whitehead totally disagrees with this. He accepts the, uh, the, the, the science of, of relativity theory, of course, um, but he wants to, uh, he doesn't want to do such violence to common sense because after all, science itself depends upon human perception, both physical perception and conceptual uh, perception, having some purchase on the nature of reality. And so for Einstein, in so cavalier a fashion, to dismiss our, our experience as merely illusory, it really does damage to the, epistemo the epistemological foundations of science itself. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's always going to be a human being reading the dial 
performing the measurements, right? So if there's no place for human consciousness in the physical goings-on of this universe, then science itself becomes a fairy tale, right? Because we have no real access to the goings-on of the physical world unless, as Whitehead says, consciousness has truck with the totality of things. So one of the ways that Whitehead agrees with Einstein is he says, look, after relativity theory, we have to accept that the universe has many timelines. It has many durations and not just one, which is to say there is no cosmic clock. There is no universal now. Rather, there are a series of timelines, and some of them are more overlapping than others. Um, they're interwoven, right? There is what Whitehead calls unison of becoming, where um, in our contemporaneous experience, uh, we exist in what Whitehead says is a kind of uh, presented duration, and that we have this common sense perception of, of a now moment. And Whitehead wants to preserve the reality of that sense, even though Whitehead we... says that it is an empirical fact that we inevitably perceive the contemporary world as a single duration. So here we have a, an instance of where our immediate perception and the uh, abstractions of science don't exactly align because, you know, in science, uh, Einstein postulates the finite speed of light um, as, as being fixed. Whitehead questions whether the speed of light is really fixed, right? Just like he questions whether any law of, of physics or constant is really fixed. Um, but nonetheless, uh, if the light, if the speed of light is finite, there's no way for us to transmit a signal from a distant object to where we are so as to confirm that my now is the same as the now for that distant object. But nonetheless, from my perspective, uh, in the locus of my experience, um, there's this unison of becoming that allows us to speak meaningfully of and, and act in a practical manner um, as, as if there were a um, true simultaneity uh, across distance, at least, at least in our local environment. So how is this possible? Well, Whitehead tells us that the projection of sensa uh, through the mode of perception and presentational immediacy, that it depends entirely on the brain and on the geometrical relations that characterize the brain, uh, such that, uh, this is kind of an aside, such that, you know, the proper excitement of the brain can make us experience a corresponding region of space illustrated by projected sensa that are not really there, right? We can hallucinate in that sense, just because our brain uh, is either stimulated or is in some way um, behaving abnormally. Um, but it's only because the brain shares a common past with its contemporaries that presentational immediacy of, of the external world is more than a barren aesthetic display. So, in other words, we can have this sense of unison of becoming and accept for all practical intents and purposes that uh, we share a common present because we share a common past. So Whitehead's not trying to contradict the scientific theories uh, of relativistic physics. He's only trying to make room for our common sense experience, right? So, you know, he wants to direct our attention back to what we really experience and uh, to kind of get us to be wary of the ways that interpretive theories cloud our direct observations of the facts. So he'll say... Uh, he says, if we are gazing at a, up at a nebula 1,000 light years away, we are not looking backward a 1,000 years. Such ways of speaking are interpretive phrases, diverting attention from the primacy, uh, from the primary fact of direct experience, which is observing the illumination of a contemporary patch of the heavens. So Whitehead's trying to say that in our concrete experience, we don't see uh, a star a thousand light years away. That's an interpretation that modern science gives us. He's not saying that that interpretation is wrong. He's just trying to get us to attend to our immediate experience um, of sort of arising in the present, in, in inheriting a past, and that in some way we are indeed in unity, in, in unity of becoming 
uh, with that nebula, as far away as it is, based on the theory of relativistic physics and the speed of light and so on, nonetheless, uh, as members of this cosmic epoch, ultimately we do all share a common past. And so we are connected in the present moment of our experience as a result of sharing that common past. Okay, I hope you haven't drowned in the weight, under the weight of the abstraction of everything that Whitehead is discussing in this chapter. Uh, but a few final words on measurement. Uh, Whitehead is critical of the dismissal of uh, experience in uh, contemporary physical science, right? He refers to this notion of the private psychological field, which is kind of what Einstein's referring to when he says that time is just a psychological illusion. Uh, for Whitehead, if if we construe experience in these terms as just a, a private psyche uh, cut off from the objective material world, then, as I mentioned before, we lose the ability to do any measurement because it's always a conscious human being doing measurement and making observations. And, uh, you know, Whitehead continues and says that if we uphold this theory of experience, then it's no use talking about instruments, laboratories, and physical energy and all these things. This is from page 326. I encourage you to reread that section um, because, you know, if all exact measurement occurs via presentational immediacy, um, then, you know, physical science really depends upon some robust notion of human experience that intertwines it with the physical world. And this is what Whitehead is after. But he'll, he'll admit when we're talking about uh, the extensive continuum, um, we're talking about something that's really purely about mathematical relations and that physical science uh, is itself solely concerned with the mathematical relations uh, of the world. Um, and Whitehead's trying to find a way to embed those mathematical relations in our experience so that we don't need to oppose, uh, you know, geometry to experience in the way that, say, Einstein does, dismissing experience because it has no place in his abstract geometrical scheme. Whitehead's searching for a more concrete understanding of geometry, which is uh, what he accomplishes through his uh, topological approach relating wholes and parts. It's a more experientially grounded form of, of geometrical reasoning. So Whitehead will say that uh, mathematical relations at once belong to the world perceived and to the nature of the percipient. They are public fact and private experience. He'll, he'll say that um, certain mathematical relations characterize our cosmic epoch by reason of their foundation in the immediate experience of the society of occasions dominating our epoch. So he'll talk about the dimensionality of, of space-time, as physical science studies it, as sort of deriving from the electromagnetic uh, society of occasions that dominate our cosmic epoch. Um, so he'll say that, uh, you know, again, that the structure, the dimensionality of space-time, right, it, it's both kind of an objective fact out there that we all uh, have to deal with, but it's also brought forth by the nature of the experience of, of these electromagnetic occasions, right? We're all composed of uh, protons, electrons, um, and neutrons, and so on, and they are our primate, they're the primate organisms that we all derive from, and they lay down the character of space-time before we ever appeared on the scene, right? So we're inheriting the way that uh, these occasions have shaped the extensive continuum. But it's not as though the shape that they have given it is just a sort of universal, eternally imposed law, right? No, it's a habit. And Whitehead thinks that in the future, as all of these occasions of experience continue to co-evolve, other dimensionalities could emerge, right? So this isn't, we don't just sit inside of a fixed spatio-temporal geometry. Um, it's, a, it's a web, a network of relations, of perceptual bonds, and as our relations continue to unfold, the structure of space-time itself continues to morph and develop. So Whitehead will say that the systematic 
geometrical relations that characterize our cosmic epoch uh, are such that they, uh, they link the rotation of galaxies to the dynamics of a child's spinning top, right? Uh, this is the magic of geometry. It's microcosmic and macrocosmic in its capacity to uh, provide us with a logical sense of understanding motion uh, and spatial relationship. So Whitehead tells us that all measurement ultimately depends upon our ability to count, right, on arithmetic, as well as on our intuitions of permanence, in the sense that the, the ruler we use to measure, it can't change size as we move it from place to place. Measurement, uh, it depends on the straightness of the rod or the ruler, but the straightness itself depends on measurement, right? So this is why it's so important that Whitehead derives uh, straightness axiomatically through definitions rather than through measurement, because, uh, you know, you, you can't have uh, a ruler that just descends from heaven that God told you is straight. You need to determine the straightness of the ruler before you can use that to determine the straightness of anything else, right? So we can't derive straightness empirically. This is Whitehead's argument, at least.